آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ وی هاف ا پرنسپل ات فری سپیچ دیبیت دت سیز وی ریکوایر اند کرییت اوپن دایورس میدیا سو دت وی کن میک ویل انفورم دیسیژنز اند پارتیسیپیت فلی ان پولیتیکل لایف وات ار یور تھوٹس اون دس پرنسپل آی سپورت دا ایدیا آی تھینک ناتینگ کود امپاور پیپل ان اوردر تو هاف انفورم دیسیژن and to have knowledge actually about the reality uh, than open media that could have uh, at the center of it the human being and his interest, not the interest of powers, the interest of commercialism. That is, in my opinion, the core value of journalism as I do understand it. Last year, Al Jazeera was credited with its excellent coverage of the Arab Spring. But I was wondering how the sort of flood of tweets and images and video clips have impacted Al Jazeera's journalism, its output, and how will it change the sort of future, how will it shape the future of journal- traditional journalism, do you think? As you do, I mean, appreciate, I think journalism as a profession itself, with time has developed certain set of values and agendas, techniques, and professional standards. The arrival of social networking into the scene a few years ago has introduced to us a newcomer that didn't have the same details of what we have in our mind as a solid paradigm of thinking regarding journalism. At the beginning, most of our editors were reluctant, were reluctant to take uh, this newcomer into consideration because now you don't have the same professional standards, you don't have the same professionals who have been trained in newsrooms. That concept changed with the arrival of the Arab Spring because of the necessity that newsrooms faced in gathering news from Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, when governments cracked down on official, uh, on professional journalism and mainstream uh, uh, broadcasters, people had to resort to social networking. May I always say we went there because of necessity. But later on, we embraced it because of choice, because we found great value in incorporating and in integrating social networks within the mainstream, within newsrooms, and the training editors to start using whatever we receive in the news bulletin and our programming uh, circles in a manner that actually, if you look now at Al Jazeera or most of other networks in the Arab world in particular, the field is reported through screens, especially in Syria, through lenses of activists and lenses of youth, youth who have been filming and have been feeding what they have collected through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. There is a problem with authenticity there. How do you make sure that something is authentic? You deal with what you receive as a source. So basically, this source, you need to have a track record of this person who have been sending this material. Uh, you have to double, actually, even sometimes double source what you receive. Put it in context. Looking at images that we receive uh, from the field, you can easily, through experts in the newsroom, through people from that region, from that country, from that language, whatever the case, they can authenticate and find out if this could fit within the parameters of understanding this event or not. However, with time, people have, in the newsrooms, have understood how to deal with social media. So now, when you receive something, you can know that this source, most of the time, is sending to us something authentic. So we can start by taking this material and then double sourcing this, making some few telephone calls to the region where this camera was shooting and trying to compare it with other people who have fed uh, the social networks with the same material. And then you reach a conclusion by putting this material. And most of the time you even put a disclaimer by saying this is what we have received, but we couldn't authenticate it ourselves because we do not have a reporter or a correspondent. But believe me, most of the time, we have got it right. So would you say this rise of social media and citizen journalism, that's here to stay now, it has a permanent role in traditional journalism? It has impact 
on traditional journalism by allowing editors to learn new ways of becoming more interactive, more dynamic, more flexible, and more close to the people. And also, on the other hand, this kind of interaction between social networks and traditional media is also empowering social networking by adding to it more professionalism. So now we have in the field people who I call them smart bloggers. And those have excellent skills. Not necessarily because they have graduated from schools of journalism or they have been working in traditional organizations, but at least with time they have understood how to deal with what they do in a proper manner. So there are minimum standards of professionalism that are there and they are growing. And these standards are growing and they are learning more and more. So with time we reach an ecosystem of balance between smart bloggers who are feeding us excellent material and the newsrooms who are opening up a little bit and becoming less rigid in dealing with this newcomer. As I was saying, I mean, Al Jazeera really sort of came into its own in 2011 covering the Arab Spring, praised for its coverage, which sort of had a cultural understanding which was maybe missing from other broadcasters, but at the same time it was criticised for its insipid coverage of the uprising in Bahrain. I mean, do you think that's a sort of fair criticism? And obviously this is linked to the fact that um, Al Jazeera is state-owned. Did politics enter Al Jazeera's coverage last year? No. The answer is no. It is not fair to accuse Al Jazeera of that, for one simple reason. Mm -hmm. This reason is, if you look at all the revolutions that we saw in the Arab world, it was not Al Jazeera that created the revolution. It was not media. It was the people who led solid and consistent protests that turned to become uprising, and then it turned to become a revolution, and they got rid of their regimes because of people, not because of media. This is what, number one. In the case of Bahrain, it was exceptional in one manner. There was no consensus amongst the people of Bahrain in converting these protests into a revolution demanding the change of the regime. Like what happened in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and happening right now in Syria. The society split into two halves. The Shias, who are against the regime, and the Sunnis, who are pro the regime. In this case, it is not the population against the regime, it is part of the population against another part of the regime. What I'm saying is, events eventually find their way to screens. We do not, and we should not, interfere in the process. What happened in Bahrain did not develop into a full revolution. It did not find that kind of space on the screens, not because of Al Jazeera or because of any network in the region, because the situation in the society itself did not allow protests to become revolutions. Even if Al Jazeera covered it intensively and put it the first headline in every single bulletin, that would have never changed the reality. It is not what we have seen in the rest of the Arab world. Sure. I mean, I think the criticism is that um, compared to other broadcasters, Al Jazeera didn't really cover big protests that took place in Bahrain. I mean, do you think that was fair? Actually, the one who makes this doesn't know what Al Jazeera was doing. I mean, Al Jazeera was the first TV station to cover all the big, not only the big demonstrations. We have been in Bahrain reporting most of the dynamic events that happening in Bahrain even before the uprising itself. The Bahraini government got very upset of us and they closed down the bureau and they kicked out our correspondents from Bahrain. And they banned Al Jazeera reporters and employees, including those who are not actually editorial inter in entering Bahrain. They did not allow them. And then we sent teams undercover to Bahrain and we did report from Bahrain undercover and we did uncover a lot of atrocities committed by the Bahraini government against the protesters in a documentary that was broadcast uh, last year. So would you reject all sort of accusations that um, Al Jazeera, not just in sort of coverage of Arab Spring, but um, just sort of more general, is in any way partisan because it, uh, of the way it's funded? Al Jazeera cannot be partisan. Uh, you know, it can't because of the makeup of Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera consists of 55 nationalities, and Al Jazeera consists of almost every religion on earth. You know, 
and every ideology. So we have people who are coming from all over the world. You cannot run a conspiracy with so much diversity. If you would like really to have something behind the scene, you can't convince all these people, edit editors who are coming from various organizations from the West and the East to lead their news with a conspiracy that you are manufacturing undercover. Al Jazeera actually could have made mistakes. And we should, I mean, in our reporting, we would have done mistakes. But we had the courage to acknowledge these mistakes and to inform our audience and to apologize sometimes about these mistakes that we do. Mistakes were done not because of political orientation or political bias. It was done because of human error or because of misjudgment or because we rushed the news before we authenticated. It happened in few cases. But in general, Al Jazeera tried always to be in the center of events without becoming part of the event itself. So it sounds like you may be making a reference to the WikiLeaks there, which supposedly uh, revealed that Al Jazeera had caved into US pressure to sort of tone down its coverage of the Iraq war. And I think you have come out and said that it was a genuine mistake. Is that correct? Or? No, the genuine mistake. Yeah was not actually that uh, we uh, changed or altered yeah. that reporting. It was a professional and one, it, I always say it is a certificate of, of, of professionalism for Al Jazeera. What happened that then, the Americans told us that this report that you have put on your screen or your, of course, internet uh, online is not authentic because of one, two, three. We checked these facts. We found that this report was rushed to be published without actually double sourcing. It came to us through one source, and this source, we could not establish its authenticity. And the argument that the Americans were making were proved right, correct. So we made a mistake. Just on the Iraq war, I mean, Al Jazeera famously broadcast and sort of printed very sort of shockingly graphic images. And I was just wondering what your editorial policy on that was. At what point do you, dis, you know, decide to, to publish these images and when do you sort of decide not to publish certain images? Whenever there is an editorial necessity, we decide to publish these graphic images. Editorial necessity means that you study the images. If it proves something that the regime was denying, if there was an incident that someone was trying to cover up, I think we should publish it or broadcast it after we warn the audience that these images could be, you know, uh, very uh, graphic, and after we cover certain, you know, or pixel certain sectors of this image, so fractured head, you know, heads, or, you know, dismembered uh, uh, limbs, we don't put that. But what we do, we describe the image without putting it. However, war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, What's happening right now in Syria, in fact, is a result of brutality of, of, of regimes. And in this case, if media does not uncover what we see as journalists in the field and put it on the screen to prevent this bloodshed, I think we will become part of helping dictators and helping powers to cover their crimes. And you don't think images can be quite inflammatory sometimes because they elicit such an emotional response. This is, again, another question which, in my opinion, is legitimate. But uh, let me tell you something. I think we operate based on certain kind of rules. Now, what people could use these images for is not really something that I should really take the responsibility for or the blame. You know, someone is killing civilians, he should pay the responsibility for his act. Regardless, I'm not going to judge what he's doing. I'm going to put it on the screen, let people judge. If they become, become emotional about it, that's it. If they understand, that's also something that I don't need to interfere in. A question on media that is partisan, I'm not saying Al Jazeera is, but do you think there's any role for media that is partisan if it's open about it and as long as there are enough other media outlets that present a variety of views, or do you think actually it is, it's a sort of job of a uh, media to aim for neutrality? I do believe personally that media that I subscribe to should not become partisan in the way that it thinks. I mean, I understand now in, in the West 
many TV stations or newspapers prefer certain kind of political, you know, uh, direction. Uh, some of them, some of them could support the left or support the right or this party or that party. That has never been done by Al Jazeera, because in order to have a healthy society, they should be provided with information and analysis that is genuine and authentic in order for them to make their opinion. If I have an opinion that will eventually influence the way that I'm narrating the event or even narrating the data, data cannot be objective. Data becomes very subjective. And in this case, we risk integrity. So this is why I argue what we need, and we in the Arab world right now, after the Arab Spring, we have hundreds of channels, TV stations. Tens of them are news and current affairs. Most of them are partisan especially in Tunisia, in Egypt, and many of them, a lot of people are coming up with channels to defend their way of thinking. There is chaos. Right now, we need professional TV stations, balanced one. They have great standards of journalism to share with the people current events in a manner that allow the people a healthy environment of debate and discussion and creating consensus, rather than have that fragmentation and chaotic scene journalists are actually leading at this moment in time. So I mean, what do you think of the sort of public broadcasting model? The public broadcasting model, if it has proper journalistic standards that are protected from the influence of the state, I think that is a great model and it could succeed. We have seen this in the BBC. We have seen this in Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is publicly funded. The issue is how to protect the institution from those who have the authority to give the funds so they not they don't use it to influence the political or the policy of the of the tv station or the policy of the media institution this is why i argue always that the editorial board should be independent from the board that actually give the money or define the parameters of how to spend the money and just final question, um, you've obviously uh, been uh, sort of working in the Middle East for a very long time. How would you say the media landscape in the Middle East has changed over the past sort of decade and what do you sort of predict for its future? During the last decade, what we have seen is more of TV stations adopting professional standards, departing from the trend of ownership by states as it happened in the 90s. However, I found that some of these TV stations, although they have professional outlook, but the subtle editorial line is, is actually there in order to serve political powers in a moment of time uh, that they need it. That's very dangerous. Uh, the second issue which I think we need at this moment in time, TV stations have become much more uh, affordable than before. Anyone can now launch a TV station. With a few hundred thousand dollars, you can have a news TV station reporting online or even on satellite. Now, what I argue, this fragmentation is not healthy. We need to consolidate these TV stations into much more professional and much more, you know, uh, actually solid. And at the same time, adopt the opinion and the other opinion rather than one single opinion. This opinionated narration of the news is in fact deception. It should stop. And it creates anarchy, especially in societies that are going through major transformation. Societies that have just discovered the taste of freedom. If we start invading these societies with these kind of TV stations, fragmenting, spreading rumors, making a news based on, 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 on fabrication, that then we become agents of disruption and agents of chaos rather than agents of change, healthy change that create stability and prosperity.